Okay, shall we get started? Yeah. Um, so first of all, sorry for the morning. I should have checked the schedule, um, which I didn't. I realized that I would always be at 2 p.m. So sorry about that. Um, so, you know, today this will be super informal. So I will first give maybe a few slides to talk a bit more in detail what is actually what the meaning of the various files are for those who haven't spent hours reading the user guide or so. And then we will just see how far you got. And actually, I would encourage if somebody is interested in presenting whatever you did here, if you want to connect and just show what you did, even if you got stuck or if something didn't work, just show it and we can all discuss it. Yeah, so that's, we should make this as interactive as possible. Yeah, and I think we will finish at 3 or so, so we will not go too long today. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> as I said, this is this hands-on session, and uh, um, yeah, this is just, uh, it's all based, as you know, on this Gadget code, and as I mentioned a few times, you need these libraries, which by now most of you probably have installed and made this work, and um, there's a couple of pieces in this code package that you downloaded. It's the actual code, it's the initial conditions, it's some I.O. reader, which is written in Python, and it's this simple post-processing example, which is also this Python code uh, to, to make the maps. Um, yeah, so th this is just the content that you should all see. Um, by the way, some of you might have, I think that's also still in the package, this job script. So, of course, if you run this in production runs, you put this on a, on a scheduler on a large cluster, and then this runs on many more cores uh, if you have larger jobs. Now, the central p uh, one of the central pieces is this parameter file. So, so that, beyond the make file, which sets the general features of the code, that sets um, things like where the initial conditions are, for example. Yeah, so this is a, the initial conditions are a binary file of a certain file type, um, and if you just specify where those are, then you tell the code where to write the output, so all these um, snapshot files. Then there are fi a, a bunch of monitoring files, um, like which, which store various information about the simulations itself. For example, cpu.txt contains, um, is kind of a benchmarking the performance of the code, so how much time it spends in, in various parts of the calculation, how much time it spends in the tree calculation, how much time it spends in the particle mesh calculation, and so on and so forth. So we can have actually a look at this uh, later. Um, some of you want to show what, what you ran, and then we can look at the CPU file to understand where the code spent most of the time, and so on and so forth. Um, then this, if you see here this output list file name, which is called scale factors here. This is actually, there's a text file in the directory where the code file is, which is called scale factors. And in this file, there's it's just a bunch of numbers, and these numbers are actually scale factors at which time the code should make an output. So, yeah, so the scale factor is the standard scale factor you're used to normalize to scale factor 1 for the present day. And um, as you know, this is also easily related to the redshift. It's, it's just telling the code when to make the output. Does anybody know what that could be about for the CPU time limits? Any idea? I mean, we haven't used that, but it's any idea why this is useful or important? Any guess? What is the CPU time limit? Why, the, why is there a limit on the CPU time? Yeah, exactly. So on, on, on most supercomputers, you can run 24 hours, and then your job is stopped. So you have to tell the code this so that it knows that it rise, writes a checkpoint file before, from which you then can continue. Otherwise, uh, you lose all the data. Yeah, so this, um, the code is actually written in a way that you can interrupt it as much as possible. It's absolutely binary invariant. So if you restart, it, it just runs as it was never interrupted. Yeah? So it's absolutely invariant. Um, so it really makes kind of a core dump of the whole memory uh, on disks. So that's the first part of the file. And then it has a few other code options here, like, for example, co-moving integration. So all the cosmological simulations are, of course, uh, you have this co-moving integration turned on. Then you have to specify the simulation time. This is, again, then in scale factors. So the time max is the end of the simulation. It's 1. It's just redshift 0, and then 0.01. Does anybody know which redshift that is? Scale factor 
yeah, yeah, well, it's 99, yeah, yeah, it's more or less 100, yeah. And then you, you have here the cosmology, yeah, so all the different cosmological parameters, also the box size, 50,000, and the units are specified somewhere below, we come to that in a second. This one. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So the, big, so the, you know, there's some heritage in the code of, about various output formats. So this has to be set to three because otherwise it will write in a different output format. So three is the HDF5 output. Yeah. Um, then here, this is also if you do larger simulations, this is very important. So if we write, if we run these production runs, we typically write many files in parallel, right? So you cannot write, if, if you let a single task write out the file and the files have, you know, the, the, the output files have many terabytes of size, it's just, it's just super inefficient, right? So you have to write in parallel. So in fact, the, the big production runs that we typically do, or the, that people typically do, they write out the files in parallel with typically, you know, five or 10,000 tasks that write the file in parallel. So you can then write much more efficiently. Um, so otherwise it just takes too long, right? So you, but you have to be a bit careful with this because it also depends a bit on the cluster. You know, if you have too many tasks writing, you overload, overload the, the cluster essentially or the I.O. system. Um, these are things for the time integration. I will not talk too much about it. Essentially, this, these are default values. So, the, you know, the, um, there's an adaptive time stepping as we discussed for the, for the gravity and the, uh, this number here is kind of a prefactor, and the, the adaptivity comes from the acceleration. So particles that feel a higher acceleration will automatically get a smaller time step, but there's a prefactor involved, and that's a kind of a scaling factor, like a like a Kuro condition. And then you have here the tree algorithm, all the features of the tree algorithm. Does anybody, or maybe those of you who read the user guide, does anybody know what this error tell tell theta here is? Any idea? Say, say again, sorry. Yeah, it's not really, Monte yeah, it, it's a tolerance for the tree. So the tree, as, I, as we said, is only opened if you have nearby particles. So and essentially that thing con controls, um, you know, how, if you, if you make it just uh, smaller, you open the, the tree more often, essentially. Yeah, so it, it just um, regulates how often you open the tree. Um, then this is something we don't use. So this is for SPH, that's smooth particle hydrodynamics. So this is a code which is not a finite volume code for the gas, if you would add gas, which we don't have in our simulation. Um, so this is a, yeah. The, does anybody know what smooth particle hydrodynamics is? This is a lot, used a lot in computer games, actually, to simulate water and things like that. It's a different way of discretizing the fluid. It's not in volume elements, but in mass elements. So you have an um, uh, interpolation scheme on mass elements, which then, and these mass elements move with the flow, and, and, and this gives you then all the fluid quanti quantities at all points in, in space. And it's different from a finite volume method. <coughs> yeah, and all the features of the, of the gas are controlled, and, and of this SPH method are controlled here. Um, yeah, then you know, the memory is, this is, yeah, we can, we don't have to discuss this now, but this is the system of units. So this is just specified in, in CGS, essentially. So the unit length in centimeter is, for most of the calculations we do, it's kiloparsec. Sometimes people use um, megaparsec, yeah. So this is approximately uh, three times 10 to the 21 centimeters. The unit, the, the, the mass unit is always 10 to the 10 solar masses. So if you read mass from the output, it will be in, in units of 10 to the 10 solar masses. And um, the velocity is just in kilometers per second. Yeah. That's the output. And then you see here the softening length. These were the epsilons that we discussed to make the system collisionless. And so, in fact, you can play with this and maybe run your simulation here with a, with a crazy low value. And at some point, you will see that the, if you look at individual halos, at least, that the density structure will change, right? Um, so if you make this extremely small, you will run into uh, these large, angel, uh, li large uh, angle um, scattering effects, and the system will not behave properly anymore. On the other end, if you make it extremely large, if you make this five or 10 times larger, then you will smooth out the density field because you artificially 
you, you know, have an artificially too large softening essentially for the given particle number that you have in the system. Again, th this, this has been tested empirically, what are optimal values, and um, so this 20 is roughly a, is a good value for, for the size of simulation that we have. If we would increase the particle number by a factor of 8 in the simulation, which means 2 per dimension, we would push this down by a factor of 2 to 10 kiloparsec. So that's the typical scaling. Because then the mean particle separation goes down by a factor of 2, so we can afford to go down by a factor of 2. And so there's a lot of what we call convergence studies typically done, where we change the number of particles to see that the results are converged, and then the particle number and the softening length are then changed um, in tandem. Yeah, so both of them at the same time. Yeah. Good, so that's um, the parameter file, and then there's this make file that some of you might also have looked at, um, and th this is a bit shorter. So you see here, essentially, the things we discussed. There's this 3PM, which is, are the details of the 3PM algorithm. So here's the and we discussed this already two days ago, the, the particle mesh grid size. And so we have here 128 cube grid because we have 64 cube particles. Um, and, and we use here 128. Um, then you can specify whether you want to do things in double or single precision. So typically these days we do everything in double precision. Um, but for this calculation it's fine to do it in single precision. Um, and this I will not discuss. There are different ways of the time integration in this code. Um, it's not too important for, for the sake of this exercise. And the, the output, we do in HDF5, and then there are other things you can um, output in addition, which we don't need. For example, you can output the potential, the gravitational potential, the S relation, and a couple of other things. And then there are so-called things for special behavior. So if you, for example, want to have a simulation with no gravity, yeah, so sometimes if you do hydrodynamical simulations to, to look, for example, at shock problems, at a Zadov shock or at a simple shock tube, you, you can turn off the gravity to study this in detail. And there's a couple of other things that you can do here. Uh, um, the only thing that's turned on, although we in principle also wouldn't need this, is the IDs of the particles are stored in 64-bit, but that's just a technical um, detail. Okay, that was the make file, and then I, I assume you all then did the make uh, command to build the executable. That gives you then the executable, which is the Sketcher 2 executable, and then um, you would then use MPI run or MPI exec, depending on your MPI environment, to actually run the code. Yeah. And uh, it would tell you at the beginning on how many processes you run it. It will tell you the system of units, and then it will literally print for every time step something like this, as we have seen before, with a redshift, um, the, um, and all the things that it actually does. And you can also see it prints out the workload balance and the memory balance. These are the two things that the code tries to achieve when parallelizing things, to balancing the work and to balancing the memory. Uh, so that's the, that's the main thing. And um, then you see um, it does the force calculation, and the force calculation involves then this uh, tree force and uh, the, the parting mesh force, typical for the 3PM algorithm, as we discussed before, and then it advances system like that. Yeah. And then at the end of the day, it will write out these snapshot files um, at the times that are specified in the scale factors text file, yeah. that, which was specified before. Good, and that's it, right? So, and you also see here some restart files. Um, so these are these checkpoint files that the code writes regularly out. So you can always, you know, if you would not run this on your own laptop but on a cluster and you would need to stop the run at some point, then you could restart essentially the simulation from, the, from these restart files. Yeah. Good. Any questions so far? So that's the, the basic infrastructure of the code. Any questions? Nothing? Okay, good. <clears throat> ah, and you, so you also see this... Um, File these information files like cpu.txt and so on and so forth, yes, which we will check in a few minutes. Okay, and the analysis, this was the Python script. You should have all seen this plot maps Python script. And then if you run it, okay, and if you run it with these 32 bins, which was the default value, which is rather low, you should um, get then these density maps at redshift 90, 30, uh, 5, 2, 1, 0. 
where you can roughly see the cosmic web. If you increase the bins to 64, you will see it better, as, we, as we've seen um, um, during this week when, when we made the exercise here a bit after the lectures. Um, but that's what you should get if you stick to 32. Yeah. So who got that, actually? OK, so there. OK, that's very good. So a couple of people got it. Um, those who did not get it, what, what's the issue? Python. Python, okay, good. <laughs>